Here we are, chapter number four in the book of Revelation. Tonight we'll cover the whole chapter, Lord willing. But I like the way this starts. Chapter one introduces us to the Lord Jesus Christ, and chapter two and three talks about the church. But you're not going to hear any more about the church until you get to the end of the book of Revelation. Look what the first verse of chapter number four says. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I was going back through all the messages that I preached for this year. I'm trying to catch up on things that I've been slack on. And I actually preached a message not too awfully long ago from 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 4. Y'all remember that message? Well, good, because I'm going to teach it again tonight pretty much. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 16 and 17, look what it says. <clears throat> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him the Lord. Comparing those two, we see that there's some things that, that are in common. First of all, there is a voice in both of those passages. By the way, we're talking about the rapture of the church here. Nowhere in scripture does it say rapture, but we're going to be caught away. You'll notice in the passage in 1 Thessalonians, it says we're going to meet the Lord in the air. There's other passages that talk about the Lord Jesus coming all the way back down to the earth. In fact, his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives, and that mountain will split in two when he comes back. That's when we'll be riding with him. When he comes in the air, we'll meet him in the air. He's going to snatch us out. You notice there in Revelation chapter 4, it says, Come up hither. Come up to me. There's a voice. In both passages, there is a trumpet. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, it says the trump of God. In Revelation chapter 4, it says it was like a, a trumpet talking. So there's a voice and there's a trumpet. The message is, come up. And then, well, that's the third one. I didn't give you the answer to number three, up. He's not coming all the way down. He's going to meet us in the air. We're going up to him. Now, some people say that the rapture, the, the, the doctrine, the belief in the rapture of the church is relatively new. And, and they're, they're kind of right. Uh, it was really made popular, if you want to say that, when Schofield printed his reference Bible. There were some inklings of it prior, but all of Schofield's notes, if you got an old Schofield Bible and the, the references there, all of those references include discussion about dispensationalism and then about the rapture of the church. Prior, well, right, even right around this time, the early 1900s, the prevailing uh, theology was that the world is just going to get better and better and better. And eventually the world is going to get good enough that the Lord Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom among us good people. That's not nearly as popular now as it used to be. You know, around 1900, the, co the country was still, it had recovered, but the, the, uh, memory of the Civil War was still pretty strong. I mean, that was 35 years ago. That was in 1900. The Civil War was 35 years before. So we're talking about looking back to 1990 for us. You can remember a lot of stuff happening in 1990, can't you? Well, around that time, things were pretty horrible during the Civil War, and things were better around 1900. But it seems like since that time, things have gotten worse and worse and worse. 
when World War I broke out, let me remind you, they said this would be the war to end all wars because men would just see how horrible war is. And nobody in their right mind would ever go to war again. That was 100 years ago. Then World War II came along. And then we've had rumors of war ever since. In fact, you don't really know, and I don't think I even want to know how close we are to war right now. We have two other superpowers, nuclear powers on this earth, Russia and China, both of which are just not really happy with the United States at all. We are not really much of a deterrent anymore. We're a nuisance. We are on the brink of war. Other passages talk about this time when there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. It talks about earthquakes in divers places. Did you all know that we're having earthquakes around here now? Well, that's divers, isn't it? Having earthquakes just all kinds of places now. And pestilence. I don't mean to get started on pestilence, do I? <laughs> oh, I tell you, I, was, I mentioned to Betty today, it just seems like every other advertisement on television anymore is about a new vaccine you need to take for something. Uh, polio is coming back. It was eradicated, but now it's coming back. It won't be long before we're going to have to take a, all these kinds of vaccines or we might just, just die. There's pestilence everywhere, isn't there? I'm telling you all of this to let you know we are right on the brink of the Lord coming back again. Christian, it's going to happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we're going to hear the trump, and we're going to hear him say, come up hither. That's, that's exciting, isn't it? I, I'm ready. In fact, I don't even tie my shoes too tight because I'm that ready. I'm ready to go. I remember seeing those movies they made 50, 50 years ago, talking about the rapture of the church. and You know, people sitting in church and the rapture occurred, and there was just a pile of clothes there. And then somebody would be left looking around, wondering what's happened. Wouldn't that be terrible, to be the one left behind? He is coming back, and it's soon. Get excited about it. I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. Isn't that going to be wonderful? I believe right now, but I, I want to hold on to him. I want to know him. If he were to drop tablets of stone in my yard with, with you know, a message written to me, Forrest, I need you to do this. I like to think I'd do that. But you know the first thing that goes through my mind? Miss Judy's playing a trick on me. <laughs> She did pretty elaborate with those stones, and I don't know how she got them up in a plane, but there they are. But I believe, I'm looking forward to him coming back, see him face to face. To hear him tell me, go, I'll go. To hear him, well, I'm just, I get excited about that. Now, if you were caught up into heaven, like John was here, he says, I'm going to show you what's going to happen in a little while. I want you to take a good look at this. John did like me. He thought, there ain't no place like this before. He wanted to know where he was. Oh, look at the sights I see. And he starts describing first and foremost, verse number two, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. That's God Almighty, and that's his throne. I want you to notice some things. That are, some, that are really different about him. Verse number three says, He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now we think of the Lord Jesus or, or God Almighty, we, we kind of picture him as, as a grandfather type, don't, don't you? You know, got gray hair and he's, he's a man. He's sitting there with a long white robe and he wears sandals. Of course you know God wears sandals, Right? Have you ever pictured God looking like a stone? That's your first answer. He that sat on the throne was like a stone. What in the world do you think that means? 
Have you ever heard anybody described as being stone-faced? Not a lot of an emotion there, is it? I look forward to seeing the Lord smile at me, but he's not going to be smiling too much right now. There's a lot that's getting ready to happen. And for someone who loves us like he loves us, it's time to pass judgment. Now, as a parent, I have had to correct my children. I have had to pass judgment. Haven't you, parents? Now, we, we cheat. We just get mad when we do it, right? I, okay, I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's ever got mad at my young and just jerked them up and wore them out. Yeah. You know, we live in the modern age right now. This man was uh, talking about he worked in, a, in the department store, in, a, in the toy department, and this kid come in and, and just started throwing a fit because they wanted the toy, and Daddy said no. So the kid got down in the floor and just screamed and kicked and threw a tantrum. And what went through the store employee's mind was what would have happened to him if he'd have tried that with his mom and daddy. I know what would have happened to me. But he said this dad was modern. He sat there and he looked kind of helpless for a minute and then he realized what he needed to do. He got down in the floor and started throwing a tantrum too and just screaming and wailing, kicking his legs around saying, no, you're not getting a toy, you're not getting a toy. And the kid got embarrassed by the dad and said, I'm sorry, daddy, are we okay? Now, I have used embarrassment to control my kids too. I uh, pulled up in the parking lot at, at high school. My son was 15 years old. And I said, you're going to have to give your daddy a kiss before you go in. There's all these other high school kids around. He goes, no, daddy, no, please, no. I said, you give your daddy a kiss right here, or I'm going to chase you inside, and I'm going to call your name. I'm going to pull my glasses down on the end of my nose, and I'm going to yell your name. John, come here and kiss your daddy. I said, I'll get in the car and drive off, but people will be wandering around all day long asking you about it. He gave me a kiss and run inside. <laughs> now, I've been known to do that. Okay, time's come for judgment, folks. Right now, today, yes, God is a God of love, and he's holding out his hand of love to us. He is showing us his grace. Don't we deserve judgment? Aren't we that kid throwing the tantrum right now? Mine, mine, me, me. And God's going, I love you. He's saying, come. Come. Well, when we get to this point, it's going to be stone-faced. There's not going to be any laughter. You're going to see a different side of God. I'm, I'm trying to impress upon you how different the Lord is in these pages in the book of Revelation than he is right now in the, in the Gospels. He came before to be a servant, to seek and to save that which was lost. Man sends away his day of grace. He's going to face a righteous God and a holy God. He's going to face a God who will judge sin. He's going to have a, a countenance like stone. Something else about this throne. There was a rainbow about the throne. If you read, it's not a rainbow that went over top of the throne. It's a rainbow that went all the way around the throne. And something interesting about this rainbow, there weren't multitudes of colors in it. There was only one color. It says, after he looked like a jasper and a sardine stone, there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. The rainbow around the throne was green. Isn't that an odd sight? Never seen anything like that before, have you? You've never seen a rainbow go all the way around, have you? And you certainly have never seen a rainbow that was green. Green talks about life. The giver of life is the one that sits on the throne. What a message he's sending right here. Now we start looking and we find out some other things. Verse 4 says, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. All the way around this, there were 
24 seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So around the throne, 24 seats. Sitting were 24 elders clothed in white and crowns on their head. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? All the way around the throne, 24. Want to know who these are? Well, let me tell you, this is the church. Seated right there at the throne of God. 24. You know, the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, isn't it? How many tribes were there in Israel? 12. How many apostles were there? Odd, isn't it? 12 plus 12 is... Wow. We're all going to be there, aren't we? This is quite a throne. Three things proceed out of the throne. You find those in verse number five. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. This is, well, unexplainable, isn't it? We've never seen anything like this before. It's terrible. I, I'm, I never have been one that, that enjoyed thunderstorms. And uh, fortunately, I've never been struck by lightning, but I'm not going to take my chances either. I can remember one night, this was back before we had air conditioning. I thought I had it made because I had a, wind, uh, a room with two windows, one on either side of the bed. And I could open those windows, and I had a fan that I sat in one of the windows, and it would, it would blow the air across me. And it had a little thermostat on it, so I could set it, and when it got cool enough, that, that fan would cut off. Man, I was living the high life. Lay there like that and just get cool in the evening and went to sleep. Sometime during the night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by one of those dry lightning storms where the lightning is just popping real fast and hard right nearby. I mean, there's, there's lightning and there's thunder right behind it. Just boom, boom. And I, was, I realized this is not a good situation because I got a window here and I got a window here. Who's to stop that lightning from just shooting right through from window to window? I got to thinking about that. And I thought, well, you know, what I need to do <laughs> is get up and shut the windows. I was too afraid to shut the windows because lightning might strike me shutting the windows. And I laid there wondering, what am I going to do? Now, this is where my idiocy kind of kicks in, or I, I call it faith. I said, you know what? I know the Lord. I'm on my way to heaven. If I get struck by lightning and die, I'd just soon it happen while I'm asleep. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> now, I, uh, that was a miracle from the Lord because I don't normally do things like that. But I had no control and I wasn't about to get up. And, and you know, the, the storm windows on the outside were aluminum. And that was just like saying, hit me, hit me, hit me. And I wasn't about to touch any of that. But I just said, if I'm going to get struck by lightning and die, let it, let it just happen in my sleep. And I did. I rolled over and I went back to sleep in the midst of a lightning storm. I will not play golf in lightning. I won't play golf in the sunshine. But I just won't play golf in lightning. You hear too many stories about the guy who you know, holds that metal club back and lightning strikes him while he's getting ready to play. Don't hide under a tree because that's where lightning strikes. Right? And, you know, they say that it, once you hear, uh, see the lightning, start counting and... If you can count to five, it's a mile away. If you can count to ten, it's two miles away. If you can count, you're all right. If you've seen the lightning and you hadn't got struck, you're all right. If you see the lightning and feel the buzz, and well, it's probably too late. <laughs> I don't like lightning. You're picking up on that. And thunder on top of it is just not good when it cracks real close. Oh. So here at this throne, 
with these 24 elders all around it, lightnings coming out of the throne and thunder right on top of it. That's bad enough, but then there's voices. This is God's demand for respect. You know, he is the master. Are you beginning to see this picture? There's a throne. We recognize thrones as a place of authority. Who sits on the throne? God himself does. And someone who truly has authority has those around that serve him. And look around this throne. There's 24 seats, 24 elders sitting on those seats. And out of this throne, lightning and thunder and tremulous voices. What are those voices saying? Who are they talking about? What a sight, huh? That's bad enough. But there's more. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit, complete in himself, seven spirits, but the Holy Spirit. And he's there. And verse number six says, before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So before the throne, seven lamps and a crystal sea. One commentator I was, was reading talked about how we always picture an ocean constantly in motion. I like being at the ocean because you can watch those waves and they kind of roll in. So, you know, they, they, sometimes they're big and sometimes they're little and sometimes they come straight in and sometimes they come at an angle, but that ocean is constantly moving. And if you go out on the ocean, even in a big boat, you know what happens? It keeps moving. And if you have a queasy stomach, guess what? You'll be hanging over the edge. My pastor up in the mountains spent his time in the Navy, and he said it was a tradition when they went out with the new guys for the first time out into the ocean. In the mess hall, they always cooked the biggest, greasiest, best-tasting meal they could because those young sailors, most of them, they'd walk into the mess hall, and they'd turn around right back out, and they'd be hanging over the side. This sea is different. The sea in the book of Revelation is a type of mankind. Constantly moving, never settled, never satisfied. But this sea, like crystal, like glass, it's not moving at all. Frozen, if you will. A crystal sea. Something else about crystal is you can see through it. God reminds us here, I know your hearts. I see you. And when we catch a glimpse of God, we tend to sober up, don't we? Get still. Well, there you go. Some more things are going on, though. There's some interesting creatures here. Look at verse number 6. Before the throne, well, sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes, before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, the beasts here, I have to take the word of, of men far smarter than me. I can go back to Isaiah chapter 6, and I can look at those creatures that were flying they had six wings and they were around God's throne and they were calling out holy 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 but the, the uh, folks that I have read uh, after here say that these are the cherubs 
We think of the, the cherubim as being those little little baby angels. You know, they're just the little sweet, like, you know, you know, like, like Cupid, you know, there were little wings and they just fly around. But the cherub had a special job. He dealt with the holiness of God. That was his job. He was constantly around the throne and he was reminding everyone that God Almighty is holy. Holy, holy, holy. In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah that he had six wings. He covered his face with two and he covered his feet with two and he flew with two. And the cherub is what covers over the mercy seat. Remember those wings come up, but they're looking down at the place where the blood is applied. They're there because of God's holiness. They're here because of God's holiness. Not that God needs to be reminded that he's holy, but anybody who is thinking about approaching him needs to know first and foremost that God is holy. Now, I noted that the first one was like a lion. That's your blank to fill in there. He's like a lion. That's number one. Now, there's a, there's a dash and there's another uh, blank to fill in there. What do we know about lions? Well, they're big and they got lots of teeth. And, but lions are called the king of the beasts, right? And if you remember in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of them presents Christ in a, in a unique way. The book of Matthew presents him as the king. So you've got a beast like a lion, and you have a gospel of Matthew. Don't you find that interesting? Now you have the second beast who was like a calf. That's a lowly animal, isn't it? And the book of Mark presents Christ as a servant. And then you have the third beast in the form of a man. The book of Luke presents Christ as the son of man. Human in every aspect. And then you have the fourth beast like an eagle. Guess what? The book of John calls Christ the son of God. That's not an accident. That's humbling to me to know that they portrayed Christ in the Gospels in four different ways. And here's four different beasts all talking about the holiness of God. And each one of them with a slightly different aspect. They're alike in the fact that they have six wings. They're alike in the fact that they all cry out that he is holy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all portrayed Christ as the Savior holy now I already told you the last answer there these cherubim are testifying to God's holiness they said holy 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 Lord God almighty which was and is and is to come and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I don't see anywhere where there's going to be a lot of running around and shouting all over heaven. I mean, I'm going to be excited to be there. I'm going to be thrilled to see him face to face. But you see what they do? When they hear those cherubs cry out, holy, 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 they go, yes, he is. He's holy. And he gave me crowns? No, 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 no. They're yours, not mine. I don't deserve to wear a crown here, not in your presence. And they cast the crowns at his feet. 
Listen to what they say again. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Is he worthy tonight? Oh, he's worthy whether you believe it or not. Do you believe he's worthy? Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him, but I think, you know, I'm not going to be looking for my friends and relatives. I'm going to be on my face. I don't know how long I'm going to be there, but I'm going to be there for a while. I have a lot to be thankful for. The very fact that I'm there, <laughs> far beyond what I deserve. He's coming. Can I tell you that again? He's coming. It may be soon. He's going to meet us in the air. He's going to say, come up to me. And you know what's going to, what's going to happen? <laughs> We're going to go up. You know, you may be afraid of flying, but you'll learn real quick. Don't you have hope that those that we put down there in the graveyard resting in the Lord, they're going to come out of that grave. I'm literal when I, when I feel, I just can't help but think those graves are going to burst open, not because they need to get out, but because people need to see an empty graveyard. Isn't that going to be a great testimony during the tribulation to know that, oh, that, that was a saint of God right there. They knew the Lord, and they're not there. And that old heathen, well, he's still there. Scary part is going to be, well, I thought he was a good one. <laughs> Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? It's the most important question I can ask you tonight. He's coming back. And when he comes back, you don't get a do-over. You don't get a second chance. He's not going to say... All right, I'm here. Now, let's take 10 minutes so everybody can get this all sorted out. He's given you right now to do that. He's not going to say, like he did for Thomas, here, here's my hands. Here's my feet. Do you believe now? He's not going to do that. Do you believe now? Well, what am I supposed to believe? Okay, I'm glad you asked because I'm about to tell you. You need to know beyond all doubt that you are a stinking sinner. There ain't nothing good about you, not in the least, not from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. Every bit of you is worthless. Whew. That goes against the grain, doesn't it? We're all in the same boat there, aren't we? It don't matter how much you shower, you're still a stinker. It don't matter how much you try to act right, your heart's not right. You're broke. That's what being born in sin is all about. And every one of us was because we got the bloodline of our granddaddy Adam. Well, there's nothing you can do to turn over a new leaf and save yourself. You may stop sinning right now. That'd be a good thing. But boy, I tell you, you'll be hard-pressed to keep on from not sinning, and you can't go back and change a single thing you've done. You're guilty for your past actions right now. Nothing you can do to save yourself. You are in a hopeless, helpless situation. And then Jesus came along. You know what Jesus said? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can't save myself, but Lord, would you save me? And he said, well, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you lost? My brother's telling me today about this fellow that uh, he was talking to his wife, and they said, you know, we really need to be in church. And, Somebody knocked on the door and invited him to church. He looked at her and he said, well, that must be a sign. So they went to church. And somebody said they just ought to go back and follow up with them. And so they did. He was all excited. He said, I got me a Bible. Well, that's good. Having a Bible doesn't save you. He said, yeah, 
I really, I wanted to get saved Sunday, but there's just an awful lot of people there. And lo and behold, the one who went by to see him, aren't you glad he had enough wisdom to say, well, would you like to get saved right now? And you know what that fellow said? Yes, I would, because he knew he couldn't save himself. And they said there were, he was embarrassed to go down the church aisle because there's too many people there. But they was up on the second floor on the out, outside deck and people started coming in down below while they started leading him to the Lord. The crowd kind of gathered while they led him to the Lord. He said he had his own off, uh, audience right there at his house and he didn't care a lick. And the Lord saved him right there on his deck. Woo! <laughs> One of these days, the last one is going to accept the Lord as Savior. And you know what he's going to say? Come on! And boy, based on what I'm seeing right now, the last one is getting close because it's getting harder and harder. Isn't it? What about you tonight? Do you know him? One of these days, if you know him, he's going to put a crown on your head. and You're going to know, no, 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 no. You're the one that's worthy, not me. And you're going to spend a little time bowing at his feet. Don't that excite you, you old dried up Baptist? That excites me and I'm an old dried up Baptist preacher. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Looking forward to that day. How about you? Whew. All right. I guess we've got to go home now or I'll work up a sweat. And we know we can't have that. I'm glad I'm saved. How about you? Looking forward to this day. You know, John didn't know my name, but the Lord did. And you know, the Lord lives outside of time. So as far as the Lord's concerned, I'm already there, right there. Are you with me? Yeah. We're going to have us time, aren't we? I understand people saying they're going to shout all over heaven, but I'm going to spend a long time right there. All right. Yeah, I'm being a little bit silly, but I am excited listening for that voice, that trumpet that says, come up hither. It's sure, it's just as sure as can be. So what are you going to do to me today? You're going to hurry me along? Okay, I know where I'm going. You want to come with me?